to make this informal question and answer type of um, session. I mean, how many how many of you are in various stages of company formation and thinking about fundraising and thinking about whether to pursue venture capital as one of those avenues um, versus companies that have already taken venture capital or, or, or other other uh, sort of participants in the market? Well, Cypherlock, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Cypherlock, uh, we're about two years old, a year and a half will be two years old in September. We're angel back now. Mm -hmm. The angels are uh, solid angels, but we're considering VC from a smart money perspective, where you know we've got some really great things happening with the company. The angels don't have software industry expertise, never mind authentication or security background, which we're looking for. So some of the mm -hmm. VCs that we're talking to, uh, you know, seem to have a Rolodex, maybe some roll-up companies, existing portfolio companies that could help accelerate, or what we deem is going to help us to accelerate our go-to-market strategy. So that's why we're, we're uh, right now at Crossroads thinking about working with some uh, traditional okay. VCs. So thinking about investors in the context of what else they bring to the table, what type of connections and knowledge and things they can do strategically for the company. Sure. Okay. Um, but others? Um, I run a company actually that helps um, companies um, with their uh, investor presentation, their pitch. Uh, so I, I have companies that, that, I have clients I should say that have already raised venture money, mm -hmm. I have clients that are publicly traded, um, and so I'm always there helping them making sure that what they're saying is convincing and is really telling investors what they want to hear. So I'm always interested in hearing uh, from the perspective of what you know, people, professional investors, such as yourself, what you're looking for now, even in this challenging environment, uh, what, you know, what, what kind of um, you know, companies people are considering, um, you know, really what it takes. So sure. That's what sure. All right. Well, I'm with uh, a company that's a little over three years old. Um, and we're profitable, but we're small, and we're thinking potentially about going up money to you know, grow the organization. Uh, but uh, what can you drop in? Sure, sure. What do you guys do? Um, we're a um, application security company. So we do, um, we've got a software resurgence uh, product that basically um, creates application hardware. Tell us a little bit about Atlas. I, I didn't have a chance to yeah. dig into what, how big you are, what your portfolio is, the security is a sweet spot. We're, um, we're, we're one of the older venture firms in the industry. We um, started out in Europe in 1978. Actually, we're a, a spin-off from ING Bank back at that point in time. Um, we've since gone on to raise eight funds and so, you know, each fund is a batch of money that's invested and then harvested, you know, um, about 10 years later. And so we've raised eight funds. We have over $2.5 billion under management now, you know, cumulatively that we've invested over that time. Um, we have a, a, a pretty broad industry focus. We have a life sciences team that principally does pharmaceuticals and um, some devices. And then on the technology side, of which I'm a part, we do everything from digital media to materials and clean technology and alternative energy through to core infrastructure software. Um, we do have a partner who's really focused on security, and so that is a bit of a sweet spot for us. Who's that? Uh, Jeff Fagnum. And, um, you know, but, but there's, you know, I also do a lot with data storage and um, software that runs tangential to the storage, so database, so it's more infrastructure software. Um, we all have, you know, on our team, we all have very deep technical backgrounds. Um, many of us have been entrepreneurs in the, in the past or, um, you know, technical founders of companies. And so um, it's, you know, those are the types of investments that we naturally gravitate towards. Early stage. Uh, Early stage. You know, probably 60 percent of the first investments we do in a company will be during the A round. Sometimes we'll invest in a seed round as sort of a stepping stone to get the company to a point where it's ready for an A. Um, maybe to answer some questions that you know are about the business model or things that we haven't quite figured out yet. Um, sometimes we'll come in a little bit later. Um, I think with the energy deals, we 
tend to be more open to investing in a B or a C round, um, just because those companies have such long gestation periods, and um, they have a whole scale-up phase that they need to go through because they're typically tangible products of one form or another. And so, you know, there we might move our focus a little bit later, just thinking about exit windows and time to market and um, considerations like that as an investment. Right. On the in Boston, on the tech on the tech side, uh, there are seven of us. So. Yeah, I don't know the exact number right now, but I'd say it's in the 30s. Mm -hmm. And that's Jeff Fagnan, who is the investor in those. So, kind of the. Uh, the security angle there. So. You mentioned Boston, but you have other facilities. So yeah, we have uh, we have an equally sized office in London, okay. and so we we have um, uh, you know a big footprint in Europe, as well, and we do pretty much all of our North American investing out of Boston. I find myself on the West Coast fairly frequently. Um, you going to RSA? Uh, I'm not going to make it. I just have a schedule conflict, um, but. You know, we, we have one person in China actually sourcing deals, and she's been out there for about three years. And we've seen some things come out of that, although principally our, our focus is sourcing deals in Europe as well as Israel, um, and then, you know, North America, in particular the Northeast. So that's kind of the, the profile on us. I would say, you know, one of the things about raising venture money is that um, w when you contemplate, I mean, you, sometimes you do it for different reasons. Like you, you, you see an opportunity to grow the business, you want to do that. Um, you want to bring in domain expertise, or you want to bring in strategic partners, partners or connections and the like. Um, one thing to think about is, is the capital, is the company a fit for venture capital? And is venture capital something that you want to introduce into your capital structure? insofar as the return expectations that um, venture investors bring with their money. Um, you might have a business that is cash flow positive and you know, quite rewarding for the, uh, the current angel investors and you as a founder in the company. Um, but when you go and bring venture capital into it, you are you know, basically signing the company up for uh, a big swing and you know, trying to be a, 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 a you know, $100 million, $200 million outcome in terms of an exit in the next seven or eight years versus you know, a company that might go on and be 20 or $30 million in, in value and just, just keep, on, uh, keep on going. The venture investors are, just because of the nature of their fund and the way it's structured and their model, are always looking for investments that have that potential. And when they see an investment that has that potential, they're going to try and make it realize that potential through the amount of capital that goes in, um, the, uh, the size of the company, the number of employees, the pace at which things are uh, brought to market, the, uh, you know, the aggressiveness with, with which a sales force is built and deployed. Um, and so it's, you know, it's something, to, something to consider as an entrepreneur you know, as to whether that's right for your company and it's something you want to do and um, whether the industry that you're in is, um, you know, is, is appropriate for that. And so, um, you know, it's something that we, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about that as investors, and the entrepreneurs might as well, too, because when we go in and do one of these things, we do it sort of in terms of there's a social contract and there's, there's, there's a partnership in, in terms of embarking on this together. And, um, you know, if, if it's not a fit, then, you know, there are other sources of capital. There's angel money. There are, um, you know, in investments from st strategic partners or from customers that you can go and pursue that, um, you know, for certain types of companies might make more sense. So. What do you, what do you see today, given the down economy? You know, what, have things changed? You know, the muscle chain, valuation, all that stuff. Has it changed it has. dramatically? It um, has. Well, there, there are sort of two components of the change. There, there has been a lot of change. Multiples are down. Um, 
the, uh, the, the traditional acquirers or software companies are out there and they are actively looking at companies to buy, but it's, um, it's bargain season for them. Um, you know, what may have been a, you know, a, an offer that was three times revenue 18 months ago is now going to be one times revenue. And um, they have so much deal flow that they're looking at and so many companies that they're seeing approach them um, to sell to them that, you know, in, in, in a way, the, these, these acquiring companies are overwhelmed uh, in terms of getting up to speed on what the company that they're, you know, considering does and, um, and, and actually engaging with it and deciding to work on a deal. And so they're, they're, they're faster to dismiss um, something if it's not a fit, if it's not priced attractively for them um, right now than they would have been, say, at the end of 2007. Um, that is a function, though, of this economy and the fact that there are a lot of private companies and venture firms' port portfolios that, um, because of the recession, have seen what they thought was their exit timeline get extended out into the future. And these companies are, you know, 20, 30, 50 person firms. Um, maybe they're not cash flow positive yet, and so there's a big bill to run them every month. And the, the venture firms, you know, collectively that have these portfolios of companies um, don't have the capital reserved. They, they didn't allocate enough capital to anticipate, you know, such a severe and such a widespread downturn in the economy. And so as a result, a lot of these companies are trying to get acquired right now. When everybody goes to market, and it's a down economy, of course, you know, prices are going to be, you know, M&A multiples are going to be affected, and, and that's exactly what's happening. Um, the other component, though, of what's changing is, I think, um, you know, less transitory. It's more of a, um, a, a sort of sea change in uh, the, the nature of software innovation. Um, you know, versus, say, the 1990s, you know, we've gotten a lot of productivity gains out of software as, as an economy over the last 15 years. And so companies today that are bringing innovations into the marketplace, the innovations tend to be somewhat more incremental than they were in the past. Um, they also tend to require less capital, which is a positive for the entrepreneurs because the development tools and the services available to you and the technology um, and the ability for a, a startup company to gain worldwide reach with its product or its message or its marketing, um, in particular through the internet and through you know, the, way, the ways that we can communicate now um, and deploy software as a subscription service and things like that, um, make it incredibly cost efficient for companies to get out there. But of course, a lot of companies are out there. Um, there also has been a change in the field of acquirers over the last 15 years. So, um, you know, a lot of the startups that were funded in the early 90s and were successful and went public back then um, have grown into massive software companies that have huge sales, force, uh, sales forces. They mm -hmm. have brands. Um, you know, uh, corporations tend to gravitate much more towards buying from big enterprise software vendors than startups, and that, that hasn't always been the story, but it is, it is to a much greater degree now. And as a result, um, the Microsofts and IBMs and software AGs of the world are out there looking at startups as acquisitions more for their technology team and their product than their brand and their sales force and their revenues that they bring in, because they already have all of that, and they can just take this and slot it into their product line. And so they're tending to look for companies um, earlier in their evolution, and they're tending to pay less for them because, um, you know, if they paid up for, you know, a company that had a lot of revenues and had sort of a brand of its own, they would probably end up during the merger integration stripping that away anyhow, and you know, taking what what they really you know, can can utilize as valuable. So. Um, that dynamic and the, sort of the maturation of the software industry, the changing nature of the innovations, um, the reduced capital requirements are all sort of driving towards, uh, a, you know, sort of a, a, an environment where multiples are, are down. Companies are being bought earlier, um, albeit on, on even, you know, less or even non-existent revenues. But um, the, you know, the traditional 
sort of cycle that we knew from 10 years ago of how a software startup evolves, gets into the market, grows, maybe even goes public, or gets acquired for you know, 400, 500 million dollars, um, has changed and changed in a way that I think is uh, sort of more of a more of a, a permanent change in terms of the evolution of the market than something that's just going to cycle back. So. Yeah, I agree with that. And there's other dynamics that talk to what you're, you're saying about the fact that the number of buyers is actually shrinking. So while I mm. and I assess and have done a ton of acquisitions, I assess is no longer. They're competing that part of McAfee. So the people you go pitch your deal to inherently is a smaller group of folks. So from a supply and demand point of view, the demand is now reduced by X percentage. I don't think that's going to change at all. I think you see <coughs> fewer vendors. Uh, grabbing more and more share, and, and Oracle, I know for a fact, is looking at what you're talking about, smaller companies that are uh, technologically very important from either an IP point of view or um, just from a client demand point of view, not necessarily that they do 20, 40, 100 million in, re in revenue, it's more a function of what they can do to slap into their system and now have their thousand uh, sales guys go nuts with this, get another tool in the, in the kit. It makes us think about sort of our investment approach and how much capital we want to put into a company you know, sort of with the idea in mind that we want to get a certain multiple on that investment. And so, you know, if, if we kind of take the sobering sort of assumption and say, you know, the majority of companies that are successful in their space are going to sell to Oracle or, or IBM in sort of a 50 to $70 million type of M&A event, then um, we're going to adjust our investment to say, okay, well, you know, we're going to put in, we're going to try to put less money into these companies, um, grow them in a more capital efficient way, maybe invest earlier as a result to, um, you know, to, to still have reasonable ownership in the company, and um, try and play that game, and, you know, and not, not necessarily try and, and force things or force our assumptions to say, hey, you know, we have to sell this for $200 million when the market isn't bearing that anymore. So, uh, speaking of playing games, can you talk to us about valuation? How you look at a company at the early stage, mm -hmm. and how you uh, determine valuation, and you know, when dealing with the uh, existing management community and the entrepreneur, how do you, uh, you know, try to justify or present that valuation? It's, um, you know, it's it's difficult to put a value on a big idea that's just in its really early stages. And you know, e even if you just wanted to try and do it from sort of the academic standpoint of, 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 a, of doing an accurate valuation versus a negotiated valuation, it's very difficult to even, to even get close to um, what if you, you know, could walk five years into the future and then look back and say, oh, well, you know, this company should have been you know, valued at that time based on the cash flows that we have now seen happen. Uh, should have been valued you now at you know X million dollars. So, you know, everybody's kind of pragmatic about that fact, and the the way valuations work out, especially in A rounds, is around. It's driven by the amount of money that you're raising, and it's driven by what are are sort of perceived as reasonable levels of ownership for the various stakeholders in the company. Um, and what happens in the later rounds is if the company um, you know, gets to an exit on that first money, then great. And if the company needs more money um, you know, into a B round and a C round and a D round and a bridge and all of these things, um, the ownerships are not necessarily just mathematically changed according to the money going in, but rather, you know, the, the management is the management's ownership is protected and re-upped because you need management to be, you know, motivated and feel like they're a part of the company. Otherwise, the company is is really nothing without that. Um, the you know the investors, the existing investors who stay, you know, maintain their ownership. The you know existing investors who don't invest in the next round typically get washed out, and so it all it all tends to play out according to the chronology of the company in a way that keeps everybody motivated and in it. So that, that, early, that early valuation is, is, I guess, in a way revised, you know, based on how the company plays so, it out. So you don't have a, uh, a new methodology taking into consideration all these factors that you mentioned how uh, the paradigm has shifted to uh, calculate valuation? 
the way the way we look at it is, you know, we look at our target ownership, which is usually in the mid 20s in terms of percent, and we also tend to syndicate the investment with another firm that has similar goals for for their ownership, and, and so. With an additional 20, you know, each firm wants to be in the 20s, okay. and so um, depending upon the amount being raised, we kind of back into what the valuation is based on getting an outcome that gives us that ownership. And then I guess beyond that, it's well if that doesn't if if that doesn't work out, then maybe maybe you change the round size, you know, to a smaller round that gets the company to a place where there's less risk in the company because you've made some progress, and then you can justify another investment at a different valuation at that point in time instead of raising all the money up front. So, so we, we see a pattern in mm -hmm. the twenties where you kind of uh, fell right into it from the standpoint that you see folks that want to stay in that forty mm -hmm. like existing shareholders stay at forty. Right. Yeah, it's it's kind of where it all comes out. Yeah. If you if you haven't if you haven't hired much of the management team yet or the engineers yet, then that employee option pool is going to need to be up around twenty percent. Sure. Whereas if you know pretty much all the slots are filled, it can be less than ten percent. Right. So. How do you calculate, uh, I don't know how many of you guys here uh, have IP or patents, what, how do you base uh, valuation or how do you look at patents as uh, you know, part of you know, your strategy, as you mentioned Oracle, mm -hmm. you know, that they're looking for technology that if they can get something that has IP, that they can factor in the channel's already there, they have the product and just bolt through it. The, 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 the patents drive the decision of whether we want to invest or not. Yeah. I think in the first place. Um, I think it's the states in Europe. I think getting a getting a global patent beyond that is. I'm not an expert, but it's it's fairly straightforward if you have those two jurisdictions. Um, but it's, it's sort of that that piece isn't central. The things that we're looking for are a. Do you have freedom to operate? So are you, you know, are you infringing on other prior art or other people's patents that you haven't licensed yet or that you haven't worked out that arrangement? Um, and then B, uh, have you filed um, sort of the, the, the appropriate IP around what you are doing? Um, and then you know, depending upon the industry, people may you know, value that a lot or they may not really care. They may not value it that much. Well, it depends on the industry. Like in, in lighting, in solid state lighting, for instance, um, patents are pretty a pretty big deal. Um, certainly, in pharmaceuticals, patents are a pretty big deal. Um, in you know other areas, they are um, you know they're they're more of a negotiating card. And when you get into you know a patent dispute with another firm, you probably un you know, tend to have a lot of back and forth and a lot of um, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of lawyers involved, but ultimately what comes out is, okay, well, we're going to cross-license the patents, or here's a royalty, you know, stream of, you know, a percent and a half or something like that out of it, and that's, that's kind of how things tend to settle out in certain industries, so it depends. Yeah, I um, think, in my opinion, pretty important, so I'll cite this uh, side view, you guys know that company, it was eventually acquired by Symantec, but uh, Gomez went after Monica Patent Infringement. And Hamstrom these guys to the point where they were really pleased in. And it absolutely affected their business plan and it absolutely affected their outcome. And as a VC, and I'm looking at this before, if you're investing, I don't want to have to have that risk. You want that risk mitigated as much as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. As far as your diligence, you may actually think you don't have an infringement, but in fact, it could be at least you nonetheless. Uh, but that, at least the patent in place, uh, tries to claim such right or such protection of, of your IP. Uh, as a VC, I personally would be looking at it going, all right, this is. This now has a whole other element of risk, so if I'm going to play it all, that's going to affect my valuation, I would imagine, to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these I know would not play unless it's a sort of sensible intellectual property. What do you think Jeff would say about patents and security? I don't know. I don't know. Um, would he be here later? I don't think so, but I, I saw him earlier this afternoon back at the office, but I don't know what the rest of his schedule is. I, I wouldn't think
Yeah. Part, like the M&A while well, on the topic of patents, I'm, I'm seeing now more of the smaller private companies that I know are getting calls from uh, law offices in Palo Alto. So I was wondering if you're looking to sell or license your patent. I think so. And you know that's a plot for somebody else. Mm -hmm. If I can buy it from the cheap. Mm -hmm. I had one thought about uh, raising money. You mentioned that, so a lot of the acquisition activities these sort of <coughs> large established companies at this point. Mm -hmm. My personal experience with dealing with the venture arm of some of these companies is that they were pretty much hands off and not um, active. The corporate venture the corporate arms. Venture yeah. I'm wondering if that's something that now they're going to start trying to become more active and getting, trying to also get involved at some earlier stage with interesting technologies. What they're still going to see. I think it might make them less active. active because if they, if they're like. Hey, you know, I can buy this company for thirty-five million dollars. Yeah. Why would I bother, you know, trying to invest earlier? Yeah. If the, if the companies were, you know, much more valuable at exit, then the corporate VC uh, arms get very active and want to invest earlier and want to, you know, have uh, have some piece of that upside, have some visibility into the competitive landscape, so that they can, you know, figure out when to make their move and the like. But um, We've seen, you know, for instance, Microsoft's corporate VC activity drop off um, because, you know, they're like, we can just buy the thing <laughs> for cheap <laughs> anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let me play a scenario out for you. So, down economy, uh, you know, capital budgets aren't there, so you're, you're, you're getting negotiated out of everything, right? Right. You're getting a lot of users of your software, but you're getting killed on price. For example, we're supposed to sell at twenty dollars per user per year on a kind of renewable license. Mm -hmm. So you're getting negotiated and say, hey, I got this much, I'll buy it, so I'm gonna give you, you know, seven bucks per user per year. How does the VC who comes in and says, geez, you know, the revenue could have been this, but it's a down economy, you're getting killed on negotiation, there's no capital budget, you've got a lot of users of your software. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Just coming back to your I would, I would look at the pricing pressure and ask you or ask myself um, how much of the pricing pressure is due to the economy and how much of it is due to um, a, a you know competition encroaching on you, um, more alternatives to your product that might be a different approach. It may not be a direct competitor, but it's, you know, you can get it done another way. Or um, maybe it speaks to the overall value proposition in terms of how essential it is. I mean, sort of in the, in the optimal case, you would look for products where the product enables the customer to do something they couldn't do before. It's not something that just saves them money. Um, and allows them to do what they were doing more cheaply, but it gives them fundamentally a new capability or a new way for them to go and make money. That's the type of product where you get this, uh, you know, the, this sort of avalanche of adoption in that given customer population because they all realize we have to have this now, or we can't compete with our competitors if we don't have it because they just went and got it. And so. Um, you know, like the, the advent of the relational database was sort of one of those things because, you know, the ability to manage and query your data, you know, that was pretty profound versus the alternative. Um, it, it's one of those, you know, capability enhancing type of, of type of products. And there have been a lot of those types of products since, um, since that. Um, and so when you, when you look at pricing pressure, you know, sort of all of these other questions as to what's driving the pricing pressure and how um, persistent will it be? Is, is it something that's just going to, um, you know, pass in 12 months, or is this part of just a, an ongoing one-way, you know, slide down the pricing scale? Can all pricing pressure, especially in software, be a permanent thing? Can there be a situation where, you know, uh, right now maybe it's going after the economy, mm -hmm. but you know, going further and further out, it's going to be, there is competition, or some other. Yeah, I, mean, I think it, I, I think it, you know, pricing can go back up. 
um, if you have if you have some other barriers to entry that make your product persistently unique, um, maybe I mean I, I don't know if eBay you know changes their pricing according to you know economic times, but eBay is such sort of a, a central trading hub for so many types of goods. Um, they have the brand, but they also have this network effect because you want to go to eBay and sell your goods because everybody else is there and everybody else thinks the same thing. And so, um, you know, eBay may not have to lower their prices in a downturn, or maybe they do because, you know, they did the math and they realized, hey, we can still drive um, more profits through this platform and we can, you know, preserve it. Um, for the future, if we if we keep the volume up and we keep customers satisfied, but then the pricing might creep back up when when times get better. Um, but of course, you know the nature of their product has that inherent defensibility. Um, it's more than just a smart piece of software that other people haven't figured out how to write yet. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you know, there are some software products that once a customer decides to adopt them, it's a real pain for them to change and move over to something else. And so that raises sort of the question of pricing strategy as to, you know, say they pay you every year for the use of this system that they've now designed into how they do business. Um, does it make sense for you to lower prices during a downturn and basically sign up customers at a lower rate for you know every year of their contract into the future or do you keep your prices up where they are and just suffer through lower lower sales volume during the recession um, but still you know maintain your pricing Um, you know, I, yeah, I think that they are, generally I think they're good. Um, they, you, you need to think through very carefully based on who your customers are, how you structure it, and what you make free and what you make paid. Um, you know, a concrete example is in, um, in, in the database market. You know, MySQL is an open source database. It has pluggable storage engines that you can um, use underneath it, and you know these basically support different storage systems, different ways of storing the data. They have different performance profiles for you know for different types of querying. Um, but MySQL is free and open source, and the user community is um, it's very ingrained in the user community. They don't expect to pay for their database, especially early on in the evolution of their companies. And so um, if you go into that marketplace with a, um, a storage engine that might be free for you know, databases under you know, 100 gigs in size, but then you suddenly have to start paying, um, you'll find that the, the, the customers in that market will reject it. And they won't even, they won't even use it because they know, I see there's this pricing <coughs> threshold. You know, it's just a bait and switch. But on the other hand, if you give them a community version of your product that's free forever and they can use it as long as they want and they're never going to have to pay for it, and then you offer them an enterprise version of the same product but it just maybe has some extra features or it's a little better, um, that model in that market will work much better than the 100 gig pricing threshold model. And so, you know, so it's a matter of, it's, it's a matter of knowing the, you know, sort of the individual Characteristics of that marketplace, you know. In, on the other hand, in you know some of these web-facing, you know, consumer-facing subscription services, um, freemium is great because it gets people. It's sort of like the free trial of the product. You know, like there's a there's an invoicing software company for small businesses called FreshBooks, and um, you know it's like, it, it's just a, a, a simplified version of QuickBooks for businesses to invoice each other. And they have 
Um, you can just go on there and click which plan you want. You can pay between $0 a month and I think $50 a month, depending upon how many invoices you're sending out. Um, that model works really well for them. They've signed up tons of users and it's you know, a very profitable uh, little company. Although, probably only a percent and a half or two percent of the you know, people that use it are paying anything above sort of that first tier of pricing. So. I think I think it's kind of an experiment that you run. You sort of like test how it goes in in the market. Yeah, I mean, especially amongst uh, the downturn era, would you like, would you guys want to see people with more of a premium model in the software world, or is it? It depends, I mean, yeah. honestly. Yeah, um, I I think that it's it's absolutely something to consider seriously mm -hmm. and to maybe try out and run some experiments with and see if you can. See if you can make it, um, see if the free one can be attractive enough that people will come and try it, but yet you're still saving something for the paid version. Yeah. No. It doesn't make sense. Right. It's very, it becomes like a web service. I mean, that's prime. It, it's prime to do that. Yeah. I open an account, give them a restriction mm -hmm. by saying, here it is. Here's mm -hmm. free. If you like it, if you don't want that banner over it every day, then mm -hmm. pay for it. Yeah, it especially, it, it especially depends. You know, um, is it valuable for the company to have a lot of users or not? And if it is, then the free, you know, yeah, the free one has, the has merit. Yeah. Right.
or they're going to look for a migration plan away from it. So it's going to be continuous future feed almost? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the fourth is in that, so I'll give you a real world example. So SSL is the top retail uh, source fire. So source fire is all about network traffic analysis and having this building into uh, traffic is very important today. As SSL becomes more widely deployed, it does become more widely deployed, you know, you have you know, craziness like billions going, oh, we just going to encrypt everything, why not? Um, the problem they run into is that from a signaling standpoint, you know, we rely on um, visibility in order for our technology to work. Well, if we don't do something about the SSL problem, Eventually, we're going to lose our signals, right? We have to integrate in that space because that's actually a hard problem to solve. We are integrating in that space because it's too far later on. But that's that's a real world, real world problem. And the important thing about it is that we don't see it on the front line. So you're, a lot of times, this innovation stuff is going to happen. You're going to have to be visionary and see it coming because my sales guys don't hear about this. When we're going into a new deal, this is not a discriminator if it's a bot or not bot. This is something that we see down the line when we're into a deal. Uh, and then you have the problem of, well, there's no demand. My, my sales management team says there's no demand for it. Why would we waste our time on it? Well, I know that this is going to be a problem for us because we're going to lose visibility, which means we're going to lose signals. Uh, so we have to do it, whether or not you're seeing that side. Do you come down with an initial authority, or do you actually go to others and you'll say, look, talk to me? In one year's time or one and a half year's time, you're not going to get sales because you're going to come back. I'm seeing a little ahead of the empirical data, actually. There you are. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm talking internally. Uh, I do seminar tours around the world, and uh, so the last one I did a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, in the front of the You know, I asked all my sales guys, seeing it? Yeah, we're seeing it. I asked all the people in the room, anybody interested in this? Anybody didn't? I go back to my sales manager team and I say, look guys, it might not be a super sexy year for you, but there's going to come a day when none of our stuff works because we don't have this and nobody's going to want to pay the bill this time. Is that important to everybody? Important to you? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's the Walmart market. back to the fundraising um, in this environment sure. I've heard and have had direct experience um, with uh, the fact that VC is really a, a focus on their portfolio companies and managing them through the downturn mm -hmm. and not considering a lot of new investing uh, new, new investment um, 
is that true in your case? Are you also sort of seeing that amongst your uh, you know, DC peers? And if you are, you know, considering you know, new investments as a criteria change, I mean, you mentioned you know, going mm -hmm. to more of a quick hit model, mm -hmm. but are there other things that um, you know, these companies should be aware of when, when they're pitching? Right. Um, so we just in December closed a new fund. So we, we are pursuing um, new investments now. We see uh, early stage investments as an opportunity for the reasons I discussed earlier. Um, and then we're also seeing some later stage companies at very attractive prices. And so we're looking for that as well. Um, all of that is sort of conditioned with the fact of life that we have a lot of work to do in our existing portfolio um, around you know, their follow-on financings and reserve strategy and the triage that goes on in the portfolio and a lot of the sort of M&A activity that our portfolio companies are pursuing right now or sort of laying the seeds for. Um, so it's, it's an incredibly busy time for us and those things take away from um, the amount of time we have to do the new deals, although we absolutely have the, um, the desire to do them right now. Now I, I know that there are, are you know, other firms in, in the space that are seeing deals and want to do them and they don't have the capital right now and it's sort of due to like, the timing of these fund life cycles. If you have a fund that's just kind of finishing off here in 2009, um, that's bad luck. And that means you're going to have to go out and, and either, either you're going to have to sit and not do investments for a while or you're going to have to go out and raise a fund in this environment, which um, for as long as the market remains down, it's really hard to find LPs that are going to be able to invest in you. In terms of technology, you mm -hmm. probably still look at a lot of companies that are cool, mm -hmm. a lot, but um, what are things you think are hot? Like what are the things you would like to see? Well, you know, at, at one level, there are sort of these kind of classic, you know, template attributes of a company in terms of capital efficiency and ability for the company to scale its business without needing to scale its employees and those types of things. Technology. Okay, so my area of, of focus right now has been around um, the introduction of flash into enterprise storage and the displacement of hard drives um, as devices for storage for databases, for data warehouses, for web servers, storage behind virtualization. Um, the, the random access performance of flash SSDs, especially the ones that are designed for the enterprise, are uh, profoundly faster than hard drives. Are you in um, we looked at Fusion IO 18 months ago and came within a couple of days of doing an investment in that company. But that is right in the sweet spot. Yeah. Really like that company. Yeah. We're using a cloud marketing. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, that that's that I think that's it, you know it's it's rare to see such profound change happen so quickly in IT these days. But you know these hard drives have been hanging around for way longer than any, any of us thought. And now that we're replacing them, we're seeing this incredible performance delta. Um, and what does that do? Well, I think, and this is where I'm looking now, is it creates several pretty big ripple opportunities in the software that runs tangential to this storage. Because you know, if you think about it, certain big pieces of infrastru infrastructure software that we use today make huge assumptions about the fact that they're running on top of hard drives. And they're doing things in the software architecture that accommodate the performance limitations of a hard drive, specifically around random access, because moving that head is like a death knell for an application. Um, and so I'm you know, working on a couple of early opportunities that are you know, essentially storage-related infrastructure software that is rethinking the entire architecture of that software now that we've gotten rid of the drive underneath it. And so. Um, Certainly not all the big opportunities, but that's the one that I'm focused on right now. Um, I also do a lot in clean tech, but you know, it's kind of a completely different domain. But um, there are uh, there are numerous things going on there as well. Uh, I'm not very deep in security. Uh, Jeff covers a lot more of that, but 
Um, you know, I, I, I have a computer science background, so I have an appreciation for it, but I'm just not up to speed on, on, um, on all of the things. Well, I think, um, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, from my, you know, being a software guy and all that, kind of seeing it, you know, virtualization obviously is, is becoming a new idea, right? It's fun with virtualization uh, because of VMware having the value that it does and the technological benefits, but on cost benefits of having virtual environments, so be it server side, be it desktop side, what have you. Um, you know, there's a lot of management need around that, of course, and management need around that. You've seen nothing really great yet, though, with Brewing got bought out for not particularly a high valuation, but for that nonetheless. Um, and I still think there's, there's opportunities on systems management, especially as you know, SOA eventually comes in here, uh, and I'll use that term very loosely, uh, being software as a service, be whatever the service is, so it's service orientation, not necessarily the Oracle DEA version of the world, but something around that where you're calling on a service to uh, make data information. And so how do you manage that process from the integrity point of view, from the surveillance point of view, from security point of view, of course. Uh, so there's some areas around there that I'm looking at as far as what the new uh, innovation idea. Of course, stuff we talk about on digitalization uh, is certainly relevant uh, from, again, the uh, ability to manage the growing uh, vast data you're trying to aggregate and make actions. And I was talking to Mari earlier about from being reactive to proactive. Uh, how do you do that? So I think you'll see these kind of step functions in a number of different spaces. Uh, it's hard uh, in software like, you know, take BI, for example, that's now um, you know, these guys talk about AI, so it's got a business intelligence kind of artificial intelligence to take information from a data warehouse and make it more into a proactive, actionable business enhancement. Uh, so that's interesting to me intellectually, it makes a lot of sense. Is that a giant leap forward? It probably will be at some point, but it will be an incremental step function up mm. going from a classic BI, which by the way, are, are seeing, already seeing uh, pain points, to a next gen of BI, whatever it may be. And maybe for BI, next gen, then maybe AI is the sequence that we want. Where, where the software sifts through the data and figures out the questions to ask rather than just answering the questions that the business unit yeah, asks. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, or, or suggesting answers. So right. Answer. If somebody calls, I call up my credit card company and say, hey, mm -hmm. you, know, you charge me a late fee and I pay it on time. Oh, I'm sorry, but while I'm looking it up for you, you know, here's a suggestion. You know, the class would be, I somebody suggesting the product you have, like a HELOC. Mm -hmm. On this market, I really don't need a HELOC, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there are other things that you know, they might be able to suggest and say, okay, here's a profile. There's a system that basically suggests you keep asking the customer this. So it's not about pitching them that versus some of you have a quick search. Okay, he has three credit cards, he's got a house, he's got a car, you know, trying to do this. Let me think what I got left to sell him versus you keep pitching this to him. And, and theoretically, your, your risk will get smarter and better at being proactive and suggesting what might be the modifiable event versus mm -hmm. the way they do right now is you see at the end of the month, you'll be the data mark to see what actually works. And now you try to go forward, but it's reactive in that sense. You're right. going to basically what people sell, right? It's quarterly to annual on the analysis of what actually helped us sell or make the quarter or the mm -hmm. year. So they try to go forward on that. But the, the market may have changed by now. The customer needs that answer to change. So you get more in mm -hmm. a real time sense, I like guess, maybe the better way to interact with the real time actionability of that data store, how you lever that. Mm -hmm. uh, which a lot of these guys mm -hmm. are trying to have like a power set, execute, or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, it was really fun. It was a good format. So. This is uh, probably the first V2 meeting or uh, uh, instrument which is kind of nice. I think it's quality. It's just usually someone standing up and you got people isolated. So it's a nice setting for what you are. So you hold it off. Okay. Thank you. Are you, any of you guys planning on going to the... Uh, Showcase or yeah, I was going to hang around for a little while. Cool. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you.